gets up to 20 degrees today, so. Mm -hmm. So we'll be open at us and this is a normal time for me to start work, so. Hey, Ian. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, so, Alison, we are live now. Um, I think we can get started. Okay. I think Jason is Jason's the only one, I think, unless he's on one of those, um, just, you know, the mobile uh, numbers. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, welcome to our Mount Everest Day program. Uh, most of you, I think, already know me, but for those of you who don't, I'm Alison Irwin and I'm Secretary of the Nepal Ireland Society and the Ireland Nepal Chamber of Commerce. Um, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our speakers today. Uh, we've quite a full programme, um, so uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Roshan Kanal. She's Deputy Head of Mission at the Nepal Embassy in London. Um, we have Dr. Dananjay Regni, he is CEO of Nepal Tourism Board. Uh, Deputy Sean Crow, who is convener of Ireland and Paul Parliamentary Friendship Group. Uh, we have Mr. Paul Kelleher, Kelleher who is uh, president of Mountaineer in Ireland. Paul Devaney um, of Irish Seven Summits and Seven Summit Solutions. And uh, all our ever summiteers who will say a few words during the course of the program. And of course, to everybody else who's joining in to watch today. Um, as, as I'm sure you're all aware, May 29th um, is now celebrated annually as the Mount Everest Day um, because of uh, Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay Sherpa uh, summiting on the 29th of May 1953. Um, there's been a long history of association between uh, Ireland and Mount Everest. And it's particularly important this year as 2021 sees the centenary of the first Everest reconnaissance expedition, which was led by Charles Howard Burry, who was born in County Offaly in 1883 and died in Westmeath in 1963. And we'll touch briefly on that later on. Dawson will be speaking about that. Um, the first successful expedition from the island of Ireland was in 1993, when Dawson Stelfox summited on the 27th of May. And uh, today's program is about recognizing the magnificent achievements of all our Everest summiteers over the past 28 years, who hold a special recognition within the climbing community and further afield for their accomplishments. The summiteers are a highly motivated group of people who continue to contribute in significant ways through their various networks and contributions to the community at large. Um, we at Nepal Ireland Society uh, have been lucky enough to have many of them uh, support and give freely of their time to us over the with the various programs that we have run um, as a society over the past number of years, and not least particularly after the earthquakes in 2015, when um, a lot of a lot of them gave their support through talk programs and helped with fundraising and all of that at the time. Um, Today, we hope to bring more climbers together to build a network of highly motivated people together to provide a platform uh, of unity and discussion to help improve and rebuild Nepal going forward. Um, today's programme will include an overview of Nepal Ireland and Ireland Nepal Chamber of Commerce's work and an update on the COVID-19 assistance, which is currently being coordinated uh, through Nepal Ireland Society and the HSE. Um, in readiness for a humanitarian flight from Ireland next week. Um, we've, we've set up a fundraising campaign as well through GoFundMe and um, contributions are coming in nicely on that as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Dawson will speak briefly about the 1921 Everest uh, reconnaissance mission. And then our, sex, and our next section will move on to the summiteers themselves who are fortunate indeed. Um, we have 15 of them here today. Um, we've never had so many as a group together at any one time before. Um, wasn't easy to get hold of uh, some. We're, we're very lacking in contact details for a lot of them. And unfortunately, because of GDPR, it's quite difficult to get hold of people unless you can get an introduction. So I would just say at this point that if any of you have contacts um, within the Everest climbing community, maybe you could get in touch with them and ask them would they be willing to pass on their details to us 
at the society here so that we can keep in contact with them. Um, uh, now, where was I going to next? Um, yeah, so uh, the mountaineering section then, um, Dr. Patrick O'Sullivan will be introducing that. Patrick is, is very well known within the commu climbing community. He's, he's the face behind the Irish mountain log, which we all enjoy. Um, and I'm sure many of you are aware he worked in, in Nepal as a doctor over a number of years. Um, so he'll introduce all of our climbers today as, as their turn comes to speak. Um, as we have a very full schedule, um, we'd ask that each summiteer maybe speaks for about two to three minutes. Um, and then we'll have a question and answer session at the end so that if anybody um, has any questions, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, <coughs> maybe you could raise your hand um, and, and we'll get to you uh, in turn. So um, before we move on um, to the main programme, we can't observe Mount Everest Day without uh, acknowledging all those within the com climbing community who have lost their lives doing what they love. Um, there's been a number of Irish climbers over the years who have gone out, not necessarily just on Everest, but um, in the mountaineering world generally, and haven't made it home again. So before we start, just as a mark of respect, I'd like to have a minute's silence, please. So if we can just start that now. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, so we'll kick off today's program. Um, I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Deepish Manshakia, president of the Nepal Ireland Society, uh, to give his welcome speech and address, please. Uh, cheers. Thanks, uh, thanks, Alicia. And um, first of all, I would like to <clears throat> uh, welcome everybody here today. Uh, so despite your busy schedule, uh, all of you have managed uh, to join. Um, so Deputy Sean uh, and uh, uh, Deputy Chief of Mission from Embassy of Nepal, Ms. Wilson Canal, and the President of uh, Mountaining Ireland, Paul Kelliger. And we have all like uh, the people, uh, the Mount Everest Summiteers who have achieved massive, massive uh, uh, achievements uh, over the past years by climbing Mount Everest, uh, summiting the Mount Everest and doing uh, many, many um, things for the country, back to Nepal. Uh, so we are all very proud and privileged to have you here. Uh, thank you again for everybody joining today. So uh, today's event um, is more uh, kind of uh, recalling the gallantry of all you Mount Everest Summit years. And basically we, we, our focus is try to bring everybody into one single platform. Um, so we have uh, come up with some concept of uh, Mount Everest alumni. Uh, I'll be talking about that briefly. And also uh, I will be uh, talking briefly about uh, the ongoing uh, unfortunate uh, COVID-19 situation in Nepal and uh, <clears throat> the island aid that is uh, going to Nepal in the next few days. Uh, I have a couple of slides that I would like to uh, go through. Let me share my screen. Um, okay. Alison, can you see the screen? Alison, can you see my slides? Yes. Yes, yep. there. okay, that's great. Uh, thank you uh, again to all. Um, so as you can see, this is uh, our program schedule for today. Uh, we have uh, quite a lot of speakers. Uh, and so I'll, I'll be uh, pretty quick. Um, so every day today, um, so as all of you know, uh, and so Alison mentioned as, as well, so we marked <coughs> 
the first summit by Nepal, Tenzing Norgay, Sherpa, and New Zealand Sir Edwin Hillary, and that took place uh, on 29th of May, 1953, a, ma a major achievement that we all celebrate uh, on this day. So this day marks the centenary of the first Everest reconnaissance expedition led by an Irishman, uh, Charles Howard Beauty from Mulinga and Dawson Stelfox. He will be uh, talking about uh, this further in his uh, speech later on. So Dawson, as you all know, is the first Irish mountaineer uh, to summit uh, Mount Everest. And uh, just to let you know, uh, we have Noel Hanna here as well. Um, he recently summited Mount Everest and he's the, uh, the highest, the record holder for summiting Mount Everest from Ireland, the island of Ireland for highest number of times, 10 times. And, uh, and also interestingly, um, so uh, Lean Hanna uh, and Noel Hanna and the husband uh, as husband and wife uh, climbing summiting Mount Everest is another major major achievement on behalf of Ireland and Pat Falvey here we have uh, we are privileged to have him here as well uh, he summited he has summited Mount Everest twice and has been contributing to Nepal's economy uh, economy massively by sending uh, tours from Ireland on different parts of the world um, so it was a major major contribution from uh, all the uh, our Mount Everest summiteers who are present here today. Uh, thank you all for again uh, joining. Um, now, uh, just to give you a quick uh, Nepal COVID-19 update, uh, as you might all know, uh, Nepal is kind of uh, reeling uh, due to the second wave of COVID-19. Uh, uh, a little bit of fortunate so far, right? And the peak uh, which occurred in the last couple of days where we had more than 9,000 plus daily infection rate, uh, it has gone down slightly. Uh, currently, it stands at uh, around 7,000, and the seven-day average is still uh, 7,500 around. Uh, so hopefully, this curve will keep on going down. Um, and also, debt rate has uh, gone down a little. Uh, so it was at one point, there were like 240-ish or something like that at the peak. And currently, it's around 100. Uh, hopefully, it will uh, go uh, down drastically in coming days. Um, as you might know, means this is the situation where when you see a sudden rise in people who are infected and who need hospitalization, uh, even a developed country is very struggle uh, to deal with that particular situation. And Nepal, although uh, health sector is not that great, but still it can manage the normal situation. Uh, with a sudden surge, uh, it has been difficult and the government uh, requested for international aid. Uh, so in response to that, uh, many European countries have already sent uh, aid package to Nepal in a charter plan. So this all comes under EU civil protection mechanism. And under this mechanism, Ireland, uh, I'm also I'm very proud to say that Ireland has accepted to uh, provide aid to Nepal. And it's currently in progress since we had this Ireland-Nepal conference uh, back in a couple of uh, two weeks back. Uh, I've been working uh, with the HSC, uh, Dr. David Wickliam, he is the main person who has been coordinating all these for the aid package to Nepal. Um, so far, the, based on what I've been told, uh, the package will contain oxygen concentrators. Um, so the news that I got recently is we are, uh, the, David was able to manage 50 oxygen concentrators. Uh, there, will, there will be around ventilators, uh, oximeters, PPEs, uh, oxygen cylinder regulator caps. There will be tons of them in a charter plane. Uh, we don't have a definite uh, quantity yet, so we should be uh, able to find that out in the next few days. But uh, there will be a plane full of it uh, package, uh, the, all the respiratory equipments and all uh, that is currently required will be going to Nepal shortly. And the estimated total is around 5 plus million euro. Uh, we don't have the exact amount yet, but uh, the estimate uh, that I've given, I was given is five plus million euro. And I'm also glad to mention that uh, Irish Red Cross has uh, kindly contributed seven oxygen concentrators after our last conference. So that's the wonderful thing that's going on behalf of Irish government and, and myself on behalf of all Nepalese community here in uh, Ireland. Uh, I would like, I'm very thankful for the Irish government and the team at HSC who are doing very wonderful, wonderful job in coordinating. And this basically the, the aid, right? Means HSC has been badly affected by the current, uh, this IT attack uh, due to this uh, attack. Their uh, IT system is fully down. David has been using his Gmail to communicate. So despite that, uh, to get to this point and to garner all these um, aid, 
is really uh, praiseworthy. And I really appreciate the team at the NCC who have done that. And Irish aid have been very helpful. And I would like to also mention Jeffrey Sean here. Um, so he has been very proactive. Uh, he uh, spoke to uh, Tanishta uh, Shaiban Kovni and he spoke to Cam Korla and keeping them up to date on what's going on. So it has been a wonderful teamwork. And similarly, uh, uh, the help, uh, the pouring of help and has been tremendous from the Irish people as well. Uh, we had set up this crowdfunding group on me page. We already have collected more than 4,000 euro and the separate group from Nagar Hope Ireland, uh, they are based in uh, the Lucan here. Uh, and so they have gone around in different houses uh, distributing leaflets and they have collected 6,500 plus euros and the money is still flowing, flowing in. So that's the kind of love and affection uh, that exists between the people of Nepal and Ireland. So I'm very, it's very heartening. I'm very glad uh, to see the support and I would like to thank everybody who have contributed so far. Um, so I'm, I'm also glad to mention that with that money raised, so far we have uh, purchased three oxygen concentrators. Uh, so each costs like 1500 euro, that is a 10 liter capacity. So 4,500 euro that has already, already been paid and two of them have been dispatched and it is at the HSC warehouse now and one more should be there in next uh, day or two. So the three con oxygen concentrators from the contribution that we have raised uh, and uh, on top of what is there from uh, the government of Ireland, the aid package. Uh, so everything will be going on that charter plan. So excellent. So this is uh, an update uh, on what's happening from uh, regarding the COVID-19 situation in Nepal. Uh, one thing that I would like to uh, be basically today's topic, uh, and this is something that we have been uh, discussing and putting around the idea is Island of Ireland, Mount Everest alumni concept. So what this means is, uh, so Mount Everest summit years, they hold a special recognition, right? Um, so once you summit Mount Everest, it is a, a certificate. So you are uh, recognized all around the world. Um, so not only in Ireland, it's basically all around the world as a Mount Everest summit year. So you have a special recognition. Now, our idea, our uh, focus, is basically the concept is bring all the Mount Everest summit, summit years on a single, single uh, platform and capitalize on the special recognition for the wider go go uh, good of the global community. So, so you have Mount Everest uh, you have special recognitions. What do we want to do is we want to get those recognition, bring them all together and create a voice, right? Provide a forum for discussion and create a united voice that you could use for the global uh, good. Uh, so another thing is on a side note, so it is, uh, so like for example, uh, well, one thing that we could do, and that's something that I would like to request as well for the members of the alumni is to promote Nepal tourism post pandemic. Uh, so after this pandemic is over, obviously Nepal would need a lot and a lot of uh, tourists to flow in because as you might all know, Nepal depends heavily on tourism. It is one of the backbone of Nepal's uh, economy. So uh, one thing that I would like to get from the alumni is uh, your uh, voice, uh, your help in getting the flow of tourists from Ireland to Nepal, uh, not only from Ireland to Nepal, from the rest of the world to Nepal. Uh, so now, uh, assuming that we have alumni uh, from in Ireland, um, then we, we can look into expanding this network to Europe. Uh, so basically forming the individual alumni in each country, Italy, France, Germany, and so and so. And then once uh, we have those teams in different countries, we can create a network of alumni in Europe and maybe further down the road, the rest of the world. So what this means would be you have, we will have a network of Mount Everest summit years in Ireland, in Europe, in the rest of the world. So where they can communicate together and they can come up with a united voice in, in major issues, right? So it could be some humanitarian crisis in some part of the world, not only in Nepal that's currently happening, it could be anything. So we thought like this is uh, something that is uh, needed are not needed is basically it will be good to have is it will be a strong force now uh, if you're wondering what would this uh, the, the the structure of alumni would be um, so it, it is not it won't be something like it will be a register or anything uh, it will be a virtual network uh, it will be bind by electronic communication uh, and it won't be in a register it is just uh, the virtual forum and what you could do is you could do an annual gathering like today the Mount Everest Day, so you all come together and you basically recall your gallantry you have done in the past by conquering the, the Mount Everest. Uh, so that is uh, basically to recall your uh, good memories from the past as well. 
And uh, you could do a virtual seminars, discussion when needed. Like example, uh, if you, uh, so if there is a humanitarian crisis somewhere in the world, uh, unfortunately, hopefully uh, there won't be any, but if that happens, uh, then all the voluntary submitters from the alumni can gather and then they can discuss and see how they can help together, right? So, uh, so the, that thing, and similarly, the, this ongoing effort that we have for the fundraising, the Mount Everest alumni, they can uh, help that. Actually, they have already been helping. So many of you have already contributed quite a lot of amount to that fund, so which is really appreciative. And you have also expressed your solidarity in helping and also asked me individually if you we need any help from you. So that's the kind of thing that we would like to promote. And I, we think that it will be a wonderful thing to do. So from today's event, uh, later on, while we progress on our discussions, uh, with different people like all the Monterey Summiters will be uh, uh, talking uh, about their experience in the past. So if you could let us know your thoughts on uh, this alumni. So before the end of this event today, so we would like to announce, look, uh, we'll go ahead with this alumni. So there'll be a team uh, and we'll progress uh, beyond that. So. So that's uh, one thing that we would like to propose today. Uh, so uh, before I end uh, my short, uh, by few words, uh, I would like to introduce uh, the team at Nepal Violence Society, Society. So this is the team behind um, the different events that we organize. Uh, as you might know, uh, Ireland Nepal Chamber of Commerce that we formed recently, uh, and this is Nepal Violence Society. It has been around for a while. Uh, so myself, I'm the president of Nepal and Society. So we have senior vice president, Dr. Jen Fenon. She is here today as well. Uh, so Jivan Timel, Sina, Gangaram, Kandel, Balkrishan Sester, he is here today. Um, and joint secretary, uh, Alison uh, Prakash Mali, Mahindra Jangrana, and we have Rose Anyopani as a culture coordinator. She is here today as well. Uh, executive members, Emma Lynch, uh, Ramnan Kodel, Kian O'Golfin, Declan Alpha, Patrick O'Sullivan. Patrick uh, will be hosting the uh, part of the event today. Uh, Neil and Prasapati, Chris Evison, Mike Witterbrun, Ted Raswell, Emmer Connolly is here today as well, and Dr. Gerard McRunning. And I, as you can see, it's a very good mix of the Irish uh, versus Nepalese community. That's why uh, we are able to do like at least a couple of events uh, every two, three months. So this is Ireland Nepal Chamber of Commerce. It was formed uh, only last couple of months ago. And the patron uh, is uh, honorable uh, uh, speaker, uh, the Cam Corla. Um, so he kindly, so he's uh, one of the person uh, uh, basically encouraged us to form this Chamber of Commerce. And the president currently is Vincent Barry and I serve as the CEO and we have vice president, director, general secretary, joint secretary, distinguished executive members as Pat, Noel, John, Rob, uh, and we have Tony. So as you can see, so we have a good mix of people and we plan to do more in the future. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank again, uh, everybody uh, for joining today. And uh, so I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thanks, Alicia. Thanks, Deepish, for the overview. And uh, it's good to introduce everybody that's working on the two teams so that people know who we are. Um, so the first of our speakers today um, is Paul Devaney. Paul is a Managing Director of Seven Summit Solutions and part of the Irish Seven Summits team. Um, Paul has six of the seven summits completed at this stage. He's been out to Everest twice uh, and on both occasions his, his climbs were cancelled. The first one was the, um, the Serac collapse in the icefall in 2014 where 16 Sherpas were killed. And then he was out there again in 2015 uh, uh, and when the earth, earthquake struck. So he's been unfortunate um, in his attempts to summit. Um, Paul has been a huge help to Nepal Ireland Society. He has spoken for us on a number of occasions. And when we were distributing aid um, immediately after the earthquake for money that was fundraised in Ireland, he um, was helping Deepish there. He stayed on after he was due to come home and uh, help Deepish to distribute uh, the aid over there. So Paul has set up um, a fantastic database over the past number of years of all the statistics relating to climbers from the island of Ireland um, since it started in 1993. So uh, I let Paul explain what the concept of the island of Ireland is and move on to his stats then. So Paul. Thanks, Alison. Um, can can I share the screen? Yes, Paul, I'll need to make you co-host. Uh, give me one second. Uh, yeah, you should be able to share now. Okay. Can 
You see that on your screen? Yep, yeah, that's perfect, Paul, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to take you to, through some stats today about the Irish, the modern Irish experience on Everest, um, the numbers for Irish people that have been there, uh, how that looks in the context of the whole Everest story, and a few uh, probably notable insights um, along the way. So it, they say that you lose 10% of your audience with every graph. I've got enough graphs here to lose everyone here. Um, but we're going to go through it nice and quickly, and it's all very light and fresh, so hopefully you'll find it insightful. Um, in terms of the whole Everest picture, Everest has been climbed over 10,000 times now by about close to 7,000 climbers over the years. Um, when you look across the whole timeline, there are some notable times in, in recent past, the 1996 disaster, the north side being closed in 2008, which led to a reduction in numbers the 2014 ice fall avalanche, the 2015 earthquake, last year's COVID closure, and then this year plugs on to the side. But what you do see when you look at the stats is that really since about 2003, for about 15 years now, you've seen a steady increase in the amount of people that have been going to Nepal to climb Everest. In terms of the total fatalities, uh, the numbers are around 300, 313 um, between 1922 and 2021. And again, there are some big outliers in that data, the 96 into thin air disaster, the 2014 avalanche, the 2015 earthquake. Um, but what you do see in the data is that, broadly speaking, the numbers on Everest who unfortunately don't survive every year um, remains reasonably stable, even though the numbers on the mountain are increasing fairly exponentially. So the mountain is becoming safer, but it's becoming more complex. And that's a, a different discussion for a different day. In terms of the Irish story on Everest, um, the first summit in May 1993 by Dawson Stelfox, it has been attempted 135 times by 94 different Irish climbers. Uh, and of those 135 attempts by Irish climbers, it has been climbed 71 times as of last week by 55 different Irish climbers. And Ronan Murphy became the 55th climber when he summited last week. Um, there have been four fatalities along the way, unfortunately, in 2005, Sean Egan, 2011, John Delaney, and in 2019, Seamus and Kevin. So we remember them today as well. In terms of how the leaderboard looks, um, just to get a bit of competition going, um, if we look at it from, from an all-island perspective, 38 people who either live or come from the Republic of Ireland have summited Everest, 29 who have uh, come from or live in Northern Ireland, some of the Everest, and we have four that don't come from or live on the island of Ireland at all, but who climb on Irish passports and are very proud Irish people around the world. Uh, Sean, I think, is on the call as one of them, um, born in Canada. Um, Anson Murphy, London Irish. Uh, Donald Doherty, born in Scotland, living in, in Canada. So there's a number of different people as well who have a huge affinity to Ireland to climb on their Irish passport as well. In terms of the county breakdown, um, really at the top two, Dublin and, and Down, are vying for first place. Noel had Down in first place about three weeks ago, and then Ronan came in and leveled up the scores uh, with his summit two weeks ago. So Down in Dublin, uh, the, Lynn, uh, the, the, the Hanna family are, are responsible for most of that county down stat. Uh, and then you see the rest of the counties down along. There are a number of counties, including my own Longford, where we haven't had any summits yet, but as time passes, I'm sure those summits will come. Now, in terms of the Irish summits per year, um, so when we looked at the overall Everest view, we saw that there was this real explosion in number of people going to Everest from about 2003 onwards, and particularly over the last 10 years. You don't see that borne out in the Irish summits, in the Irish stats. Uh, really, for the past 15 years, the stats have remained broadly the same. So, you know, between, if you look at the number of people that are summiting every year, it's between three and four and seven people every year, and really hasn't changed all that much for the past 15 years. So, if you look at the cumulative view, that brings you up to your 71 summits by the end of, by the, end of the season in 2021. In terms of Irish attempts every year, so the number of people that go there trying to climb it, again, we see a very stable pattern um, between five and six people every year for the past 15 to 18 years. Really hasn't changed all that much this year. There were five people on Everest, three of them summited, two of them didn't. Uh, that's, that's a very 
regular year in, in terms of the Irish on Everest. The cumulative view brings you up to 135 attempts by the end of the 2021 season. In terms of the preferred route, 65% of people who summited Everest from Ireland have preferred the Nepal route as opposed to the Tibet one. In terms of a success rate, 53% uh, of those who have attempted uh, Everest from Ireland have su succeeded. Um, and the, the success rate on Everest broadly, just outside of the Irish context and the wider context, it has increased. Um, around the time when Dawson was climbing in 93, it was in the low 20s. Um, so that period from 1990 to 2006 has broadly got about a 30% success rate. Um, that success rate is now about 65% in the period from 2006 to 2019. So two thirds of those who go to Everest nowadays will succeed. The Irish number is a little bit below that. In terms of prior 8,000 meter experience, um, this is a surprising one, I suppose. 68% um, of those who are summiting Everest from Ireland have had no prior 8,000 meter experience. Now that's a, a deep hole that you could jump into in terms of discussion. It's a complex issue as well, in terms of what makes a good candidate to be able to climb a mountain like Everest but it's an interesting stat nonetheless. In terms of the gender split, uh, Ireland 84% male, 16% female. I think we're behind on this uh, because anyone that's been to base camp for the past number of years, um, this is not the reality on the ground right now. Um, so I think more, more needs to be done on these numbers from an Irish perspective, but it's a majority male percentage at the moment. In terms of age distribution, um, we're actually pretty even across the board on this. The average age of an Irish person summiting Everest is 42. I'm 43 now, so I guess that's too late for me. But um, the, the earliest we have is, is Anselm Murphy on the left, 24 years of age, and Martin Byrne from Offaly at 58 on the other side. So I guess the message from this is it's never too late. If you look at that in the context of the overall age distribution on Everest, the youngest being 13, the oldest being 80, uh, the Irish view is really very flat and, and there's a lot of people summiting in their 40s and 50s. Some notable, I guess, the most Irish summits, um, Noel Hanna has just come back from summiting Everest for the 10th time, six from the Tibet side and four from the Nepal side. I hope I had that right. Um, so he's in number one position. Uh, Robert Smith from Tyrone, has six summits of Everest. He summited Everest for the sixth time two weeks ago with Madison Mountaineering. So he has two from Tibet and three from, that should be, uh, I think two from Tibet and four from Nepal. Um, Pat Falvey has two summits of Everest, first person, Irish person to summit from both sides. And Lynn Hanna has two summits of Everest, first Irish woman to summit from both sides. All of the other 51 Irish summiteers have climbed Everest once. Um, and just to pick out a few, from the many, and there are many stories that you can dive into on, on, on the Everest summiteers. Dawson, the first Irish climber to summit Everest, also the first climber from Britain or Ireland to climb via the North Ridge. Uh, Claire O'Leary, Dr. Claire O'Leary is the first Irish woman to climb Everest and the first Irish woman to complete the seven summits. Pat, Pat Falby, the first Irish person to climb Everest from both sides and the first person in the world to complete the seven summits twice via both sides of Everest. And Noel pops up again. He's the first person in the world to complete the seven summits, including Everest from summit to sea. Linda Blakely uh, from Lurgan in County Armagh is the first Irish climber and first British woman to climb Everest and Lutze in the same season when she summited both of them in 2018. And Robert Smith from near Oma in County Tyrone is the first Irish male to have climbed Everest and Lutze in the same season the following year in 2019. And the world record holders, Noel and Lynn, hold world record. First married couple to summit together for, from both the Nepal and Tibet side, 2009 and 2016. Uh, that's an amazing achievement. Um, and there are many other notable insights. I've just picked out a few. Um, Gavin Bate uh, reached the top of Everest on his fifth attempt in 2011. So, you know, the narrative that you go there and you get there in your first attempt, um, there are some very interesting stories of people that have been there a number of times. And his is probably one of the more interesting, fifth attempt in 2011. Martin Byrne reached the top on his fourth attempt in 2011. Patricia McGurk from County Loud attempted Everest three times and she reached 8,650 meters on her third attempt, uh, but she never summited. Um, and another notable expedition was in 2007 when doctors Nigel Hart and Roger McMurrow were part of a, a wider expedition 
um, that took measurements uh, to measure the level of oxygen in human blood at 8,400 meters in the balcony. And they were part of that extreme Everest expedition. They were also involved in a very dramatic rescue on the way back down, which is a, an incredibly interesting story in of itself. So that's a little bit of an insight into the stats on Everest. If you'd like to find out more, please head across to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or head across to irish7summits.com. And I just finish off by saying that um, there are 71 peaks in Nepal above 6,000 meters, 42 of them are above 7,000 meters, and eight of them are above 8,000 meters. So there's a, great, there's, a, there's a great plethora of peaks there to try and get the pedigree you need if you aspire, as I do, to be part of this illustrious alumni of people who have summited Everest. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Um, that's fantastic insight. I think you have to be um, commended first of all in setting up this archive. It's, it's, a, it's a tremendous facility to have for the Irish story on Everest. And it's, it's not just in the setting up of it, but in the maintenance of it every year updating the stats, interviewing the climbers that are going out. So there's a huge amount of work has gone into it already and is going into it on an ongoing basis. So well done on that. Um, I suppose uh, the other thing that comes out of those stats there is the um, capabilities and the tenacity of some of the climbers that are out on Everest from, from the island. Um, when you mentioned Pat and Noel and Lynn and all of those other attempts where they went, not just on their first attempt, but had to go back uh, on numerous occasions to get the summit and um, the, the people that are out there climbing are, are um, real high achievers um, and that's very obvious from, from what you've put up there on the slides and I suppose just to, to finish up um, we have to wish you well on your own attempt for whenever you do get out there um, you know going forward in the future so we hope that uh, you'll make it to the summit at some stage in the, in, in the not too distant future so thanks for that Paul. Um, okay, so moving on, our next speaker is uh, Paul Kelleher, and Paul is president of Mountaineering Ireland. So, Paul, if you'd like to uh, come on here. Um, thank you, Alison, and thank you, Paul, for that very fascinating uh, set of statistics. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to follow that, uh, but I will be brief. Uh, Mr. President, Madam Secretary, uh, Madam Deputy Chef de Maison, uh, Deputy Crow, Ever Summiteers, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted as President of Mount Nearn Ireland to be able to join this auspicious gathering uh, of Irish Ever Summiteers in this important anniversary year. Uh, Mount Nearn Ireland, as you will all know, is the representative body for hillwalkers and climbers on the island of Ireland and is recognised as the national governing body for mountaineering, hillwalking and climbing by both Sport, Sport Ireland and Sport Northern Ireland. I think in many ways we are pleased to you know, have supported many of, their, many of those climbers uh, and Everest summiteers on their journey uh, throughout the years in developing skills and, and indeed supported some of the expeditions directly. Um, Today, obviously, May 29th is the day that in 1953, Everest was first climbed by uh, Tenzing and Edmund uh, from the Nepal side. And then 40 years later, Dawson's first Irish ascent uh, made from Tibet was obviously you know, a very significant achievement, both for him personally, uh, but also for Irish mountaineering. And in a way, he kind of paved the way for others to follow. And um, since then, um, uh, I've kind of wrote there's possibly been 70 other Irish ascents. Thanks, Paul. It's actually 71. I was fairly close. Uh, and, you know, I think these have been obviously significant achievements for everybody involved. Uh, and on behalf of Mountaineer in Ireland, I would like to congratulate all of those summiteers on their success. Uh, and I guess climbing Everest is something mountaineers from all over the world aspire to do. Uh, and as fellow mountaineers, we can understand that the desire to climb the highest mountain on the planet, you know, and ultimately that is driven by the desire for adventure that we all share. Um, now Everest has seen growing pressure and crowding in recent years and, and kind of far from the pristine wilderness of 1953, uh, we're now seeing many Irish uh, mountaineers kind of seeking out new adventures on other 8,000 meter peaks uh, in Nepal and Tibet. Uh, and indeed, some of the unclaimed six and seven thousand meter peaks. Uh, those are mountains with different challenges and perhaps a less pressured field. But in a way, that is a continuation of a journey of kind of adventure and the human desire to seek out new challenges. Um, and it's fantastic to see that continued kind of Irish exploration. 
Um, Ireland obviously has a long history of involvement at Everest, and, and you know, we've already mentioned the 100th anniversary of the Everest Reconnaissance Expedition in 1921, uh, which was led by Irishman uh, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Charles Hard Bewey, uh, who was from Mongar. Uh, and many of you will have had the recent pleasure of um, the presentation by Frank Dawson and Beth, uh, which was kind of really interesting in terms of that 100th year anniversary. Uh, and I think we're going to hear a wee bit more on, on that from Dawson shortly. And I suppose finally, all I want to say is, you know, when it, it, um, Debbie should mentioned it already, but, you know, whilst we're celebrating this important anniversary and the successes of Irish Mountaineers, we have to recognise the current situation in Nepal. Uh, and, you know, on behalf of Mountaineer Ireland and indeed the whole community here, I would like to extend our kind of thoughts and wishes uh, to the people of Nepal in their, in their efforts to control this terrible disease. Um, Ireland has a long association with helping others and indeed, you know, our own stories of tragedy in our past as well. Uh, you know, so I'm delighted to hear that, you know, the support being provided by the Irish government and, and Irish people will make a difference. And uh, I'm sure, you know, it, it takes a little encouragement uh, to the audience here to you know, encourage you to continue to support the community and our friends in Nepal. And, and obviously you can, debate, you can donate through the Nepal Ireland Society. Uh, to help ongoing efforts there. So uh, just maybe end on that note. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, both yourself and, and um, Paul Devaney have, have raised a, a very valid point there. We're here today to celebrate Everest Day, but we shouldn't forget that there are other six and 7,000 metres and there's a, actually um, unclimbed peaks there as well that are there for the taking. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that should always be borne in mind, say, for people training for going out to Everest. And Paul's stats show that, that so many people that go out there and have never climbed seven or 8,000 metre mountains before. So it's one way of actually helping to support the economy of Nepal by going out and actually climbing those other mountains before you actually attempt Everest as well. So, um, yeah, it's a, very, it's a very valid point and thank you for making it. Um, okay, so we'll move on quickly to our next speaker. Um, Dr. Mananjay Regmi is uh, CEO of the Nepal Tourism Board. Uh, Dr. Regmi, are you there? If you could switch on. Yeah, namaste, namaste everyone. Namaste. Well, <coughs> uh, President of Nepal Island Society, President of Mountaineering Ireland, Deputy Chief of Mission uh, for Nepal Embassy in London, distinguished Everest Summiters from Ireland and uh, <clears throat> all the participants of uh, this meeting. Namaste from Nepal. And uh, especially thank you for the organizers for this virtual meeting being organized to observe the International Mount Everest. Uh, we call a Sagarmatha Day as well. So I appreciate the initiative of Mr. Dipesh Sakkeji uh, to celebrate this great day, which uh, coincides with the Republic Day of Nepal and International Peace Day also. And so this makes this day a very, very more special. So <clears throat> uh, I was uh, hearing a very wonderful presentation of uh, uh, just before, I think Paul or I forget, uh, yeah, Paul Devne. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, I was so surprised that uh, you did a, such a, you have such a wonderful collections of the data uh, and uh, uh, when I was uh, uh, looking at your presentation, one thing made me uh, very much, uh, you know, uh, 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 put my uh, attention there. That was the number of people I've attempting three, four times, and some even the up to the five times. So the Everest is become a kind of a place where everybody wanna go from the, all over the world, not only for the climbing but for the trekking as well. So people who are visiting Nepal, they're the first objective is to go to the Everest or the base camp. So, the, and uh, because of this, uh, I am uh, not only in the summit, but also in the uh, trekking trail, there are a number of questions always raised that Nepal is issuing more permission to go to the mountains than uh, the ca carrying capacity of, the, of that uh, particular area. And uh, there were a number of news in the uh, uh, Guardian and also in a number of uh, international newspapers about the uh, number of people waiting to climb to the top of the Everest. So we were discussing about this issue in Nepal and uh, we were thinking about how we can uh, 
you know, uh, keep our image good at the same time, how we can uh, provide the opportunity to climb more people to the Everest. So looking at the data that, uh, that the one people is trying to climb, uh, you know, they are do, do, doing uh, several attempts to climb the Everest and uh, they are getting success in three, four, five attempts. This um, uh, give a, a new idea, which I think, uh, uh, so we can, we, we are thinking about uh, dividing Nepal into three, four parts where people can climb two peaks at least uh, of around 6,000 meter, one peak of 7,000 uh, plus meter, then only they can go to the 8,000 meter peaks. Uh, so this will help uh, first to uh, uh, get the people who are going to climb to get experience with the Himalayan mountains. And at the same time, this will uh, reduce the pressure on the Everest area alone. So at the same time, this will help to overall development of the Nepal from east to west. I don't know how the uh, this uh, mountaineering community will take this proposal, but uh, this is just under the discussion. This is what the idea just uh, we have developed in Nepal now. This is also under the discussion and there are a number of positive and negative both sort of feedbacks we are receiving on this. So today I would like to take an opportunity to put this proposal again there to so especially for your feedback. It is not if, if we find that more people all around the world don't like this idea then we will not go for it. Certainly we respect the feelings of the mountaineers or the trekkers who love Nepal who, who are visiting Nepal but at the same time it is our responsibility also to keep the mountains neat and clean for the future generations as well and uh, to uh, give the best services, best possible services, and also to keep uh, developing the all uh, Nepal mountaineering area equally so that uh, people from one particular mountain area should not feel uh, themselves deprived from the facilities. So there are so many challenges to the government, but that is from our side, but from your side also, I would like to. So Dipesh ji, I, I would like to request you to you know, collect the feedbacks from all the part, uh, all the participants, and please uh, uh, come up with the their suggestions. Uh, please advise us so that we can uh, come up with the, some uh, new decisions in the future. So this is one, and the another major uh, uh, concern is again. You know, th these are the we we also have a number of data, but uh, I haven't uh, uh, collected the data the way the poll have shown, and this uh, uh, gives me a number of new ideas 10208 people is not a small number of people who climb there and 313 fatalities and out of them all the time because these because of the climate change and now the because of the rising temperature the glacier ice is melting and number of new dead bodies are um, uh, appearing are, are uh, coming in the ground so this year also we have uh, collected uh, uh, from five different mountains, uh, um, a very large amount of uh, uh, garbage. It is around, I think, the 10 ton of the garbage from the different part of the mountain. So uh, there are two dead bodies were also found. So this is also the one, another problem. And for some people, uh, we found that people think it as a, a kind of, uh, sorry, I think we are here to celebrate, but I'm talking about the problems. Please consider it because I never find this forum to discuss all these things because I'm always looking for the good feedbacks and you, uh, you know, so that we can amend something in the policy level that will help to develop the Nepal as a uh, good destination or a, or a preferred destination. So, uh, so I was thinking for some people, it, it might be as, uh, you know, they come up with the saying that, no, let them, let the, do you want to take the dead body? They say, no, it's fine. Let, let him rest in peace. He used to love mountain. That's fine. But how many people we, so I think we need to come up with a very clear uh, thing that uh, if something, some casualties happen, then the dead bodies should be uh, taken out of the mountain. They shouldn't be left there, even though the everyone who go to the mountains, who climb, who track, they certainly loves. We all respect that. But uh, I think we need to have uh, some very clear policies on that as well. In the past, we don't have a clear policy. And uh, with the just by the concern of the uh, family members, we used to leave uh, the dead bodies there. I think that now, the because and the situation getting much worse because of uh, the rising temperature and the exposure of those uh, uh, bodies. So, this is the one uh, another thing that we need to think about. Another the number of the every year, 
uh, normally you all are the climbers and uh, you uh, the i think the, our these uh, mountain uh, your organizing companies they do charge you some amount of the money as a deposit but once you come and once you finish your expedition and they said that oh, oh we have bought back all the garbage uh, to Kathmandu and we have deposited but normally they don't and then there were so many big uh, deep crevasses and most of the garbage goes on the crevasses which uh, nobody can uh, even take it out later if they really want to do that hello Yes, we can hear you. Uh, uh, am I clear? Yes. Yeah. yes, yes okay. So, uh, so the people, you know, we take the. Uh, there are some problems going on because of that. Like, uh, so what we want, uh, we are thinking about uh, making it uh, those deposits kind of a non-refundable deposit because so far it is a refundable deposit. Uh, these people who claim that they have bought back their all the garbages, they get it refunded. But we want to make it a kind of a non-refundable deposit uh, so that uh, this money can be used for the, uh, for the cleanup uh, later on. Because every year, this year also, we have spent almost around uh, $2 million uh, to clean up the mountains. So every year, there is no meaning of spending a, such a big amount of money and again, appointing a number of army officers and other people just to clean up the mountains. Instead, we can make a kind of a rule where the, all these climbers, they took also are responsible. They should also make sure, make sure that the, all the garbages they have taken up to the mountain that is brought back to uh, the lowland or uh, to the place where it can be uh, managed. So, but before, in the past, what people used to go on a trekking, they used to go up to the mountains, they used to take a, they, now also for the acclimatization purpose, certainly the most of the climbers are walking up. But once they finish their climbing, they just fly back. And there are, I don't know how many of you uh, are flying back, but most of the time, the most of these uh, climbing agencies who are giving these services, they are offering, why don't to, to fly back? And obviously after you accomplish the top of the world, uh, the more, the miss your target, obviously most of the people uh, choose to fly back. And what, what happened after they fly back, they don't know what happened in the back. And normally this, and we are trying to, because, it's, it's a responsibility of both. The agencies are trying to uh, make more money and they're they are, they are not doing their duty. We are trying to make a rules for them as well, but at the same time, we are trying to make the people more responsible. And another is like, a, uh, after finishing, if somebody got sick, if somebody had to be rescued from the mountain, we certainly need to uh, provide a rescue helicopters. But what happened nowadays, once you finish, people are just flying, but that is increasing the chances of more, if they are, if people are flying from the second camp or third camp, this is increasing the sound pollution in the mountain. At, and it is irritating. If I am doing a Everest uh, trekking somewhere, and if I see uh, in every two minutes, there is a helicopter flying up, that's going to be irritating. And I think it's, it's, a, it's because now that we are, we are talking with our uh, helicopter companies not to fly more, but they say, no, no, it is a demand because people are really sick. And you cannot say in the high altitude, you say, oh, no, no, I have a headache, then it is, you, you are sick. And as soon as you came in the low altitude, you just can say, oh, I'm okay. And then, so I think we need to come up with the, some, uh, you know, very, very uh, clear rule and regulations about the uh, helicopter flights as well. So um, uh, these are the, some of the problems that are going on in the mountains and that we really want to uh, solve these uh, issues so that uh, we can make our mountains more uh, attractive. Uh, to the people, and uh, uh, I think it's a duty of all the all the concerns uh, for, of the climbers, of the agencies who are here, and the officials, uh, government officials like us. So, if we jointly make some uh, effort, I think we can uh, solve most of these issues. Whatever I am saying, it is under the consideration and under, under the discussion. It is not. I am looking for your suggestions on each and every point that I've, that I have raised. Anyway, this is today. Actually, we are here to celebrate uh, uh, the day to co to commemorate the historical event of the first ascent of the Mount Everest uh, by Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenjin Norge. But uh, at the same time, I'm talking a lot of other things. Uh, but what I'm taking so much concern is that this glacier is my own 
uh, a kind of a field of expertise and I understand them. And then the way the Nepal is promoting mountains and uh, promoting uh, only the two or three places in the uh, mountain, especially Makalu, Annapurna, Langtang, sorry, uh, Everest, Annapurna and Langtang, that is creating a big problem from every <laughs> Uh, big stone, if you go behind them and if you can see a number of garbages that people have stored there or they have just buried by the stones. In ultimately, these all things are going to be a very, very big issue. This, these mountains are not only of one person or two person. These are the source of the whole uh, water, uh, water source for the whole, Indo, uh, whole population living in the Indo-Gangetic plain as well. So, we need to be more, uh, uh, you know, more responsible from the trackers or the, from the tourist side also, from our side also. And uh, let's, uh, uh, you know, today, let's uh, on this average day, that let's uh, uh, make a commitment together that uh, we all the mountaineers, adventure lover, alpinist, mountain experts all around the world, that we let's we give a more emphasis, more respect to the environment and come up with the, the more better solutions. And we will uh, act as a more responsible tourist uh, and uh, uh, and uh, the one more one more important thing is I'm just coming out of the budget uh, today. We had a budget um, announced just uh, half an hour back, and the government has announced that they are going to focus more on the more on uh, these. Uh, uh, mountain uh, adventure activities, especially trekking, skydiving, paragliding, high mountain marathon, mountain biking. And so, so this makes me again think, okay, government is also focusing, going to put more money on that. And then what? Again, if we go again in the every, because if we do again in the same three places of Nepal, it's going to be a big, big problem for the future. So I think uh, I'm from here also, we will try to uh, make these all investment in the other uh, new areas where we don't have the much population. Uh, so this is uh, what, uh, and uh, if uh, there will be, a, because no, normally in Nepal, uh, what the for what the number of the journalists or the what the international papers to write that makes a very big impact. People take it more seriously. So my, I, uh, from your side, whenever you had an opportunity to talk about the Nepal, because today I'm talking, I'm uh, there are the all the you every summitters are here. So I think you are the uh, you are the um, uh, legend of Nepal and. In Nepal, you all have a, a good connections and people respect you, people love you. So I would like to request you all, and you all are also a goodwill ambassador of Nepal as well. So, uh, you know, so I uh, really uh, want you to, whenever you uh, want to request you, whenever you have a chance to talk about the Nepal, please uh, advise them that it should be, uh, you know, uh, distributed all over the Nepal and it should not be focused only in one or two particular areas that will uh, create a problems in the future. So, well, uh, not taking much time, I would like to again thank everyone for this, uh, who organized this uh, today's uh, virtual meeting. Uh, thank you for, and uh, thank you for inviting me to give a, a short talk. And uh, uh, once again, thank you for the meeting and wish you all safe stay. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, Dr. Regmi. Um, it's, it's fantastic to hear that uh, the tourism board are considering uh, measures to try and improve things in the mountains. I mean, we're all aware of the, the problems with the rubbish, particularly in the Everest and Annapurna regions. And as everybody in any kind of uh, mountaineering circle would be aware, really, we're only caretakers. You know, we have to leave it there for people of the future. And the way climate change is, is, is moving, you're correct in what you're saying with the glaciers melting and the water table uh, going right down into the Indian Plains. It's important that it's all looked after. Um, so I suppose one way are if, if we get this network up and running, as you say, the summiteers are very well respected and um, they have an opportunity to try and uh, improve the situation by promoting other peaks within Nepal, but not necessarily just the mountains. There's a lot more that uh, Nepal has to offer in terms of tourism um, other than trekking and mountaineering. There's the cultural side and the food side and all of that. So it has to be looked at, I suppose, in, in a bigger picture. Um, but certainly the, the, the issue of the crowds uh, on Everest in particular, it's, it's good to hear that it may be addressed going forward. So th thank you for your input and thank you for joining us today.
Um, okay, so our next speaker uh, is uh, Ms. Roshan Kanal, who is Deputy Chief of Mission with the Nepal Embassy in London. Uh, Roshan, are you there? Namaste. Namaste. Thank you, Ms. Alishan. Uh, distinguished Chief Guest of the Program, Honorable uh, Deputy Sean Crowe, Convener of Ireland Nepal Parliamentary Friendship Group, Dr. Dhananjay Regni, CEO of Nepal Tourism Board. Mr. Paul Kilager, uh, President of uh, Mountaineering Ireland. Mr. Dipesh Mansake, President of uh, uh, Nepal Ireland Society and CEO of Ireland Nepal Chamber of Commerce. All the brave and courageous um, Mount Everest submitters, all the distinguished guests and guests and participants. Good afternoon and namaste. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to speak on this eminent gathering of great Irish Mount Everest Summiters and friends of Nepal. I express my sincere thanks to Mr. Dipesh Mansake, Mrs. Alishan, and whole team of Nepal Ireland, Ireland Society for organizing this event. On this day uh, of Mount Everest, day 2021, I would like to recognize and appreciate all the brave, brave climbers who have successfully submitted the Mount Everest and remember the ones who, who lost their lives during. Um, during um, climbing. Uh, today is also the 14th Republic Day of Nepal. Uh, and taking this opportunity, I wish to extend my best wishes for the good health, happiness, and prosperity to all, all the Nepalese living in Ireland, UK, and Malta on behalf of His Excellency the Ambassador, Embassy of Nepal, and on my own. I feel very proud and thrilled to be a part of this event organized to felicitate the gallant figures who have successfully committed the Mount Everest. I would like to pay my tribute to all the submitters for their gallantry and at the same time for their contribution in further strengthening our bilateral relations through stronger people-to-people -people ties. They have significantly contributed in promoting Nepal and its image in Ireland and the world. I would like to extend my heartfelt con congratulations to all those who are being felicitated today. I'm amazed to see um, several records that uh, Irish climbers have uh, made, um, climbers and mountaineers have made during um, these years uh, that um, Mr. Paul has presented in his presentation before. Nepal and Ireland have been enjoying excellent relations since the establishment of diplomatic relations in August 1990. The government of Nepal uh, attaches great importance to its relations to Ireland. Ireland has been contributing for socio-economic development of Nepal as well as for the humanitarian cause to different non-governmental organizations. The government of Nepal and Nepali people highly value the development cooperation from Ireland. The new variant of COVID-19 pandemic has caused devastating effects in Nepal at the moment. Um, you all are um, aware about this. Uh, due to sudden uh, surge in cases of new variant of COVID-19, our health system is overwhelmed and there is acute shortage of oxygen and beds. As of today, over 7,000 people have lost their lives and more than uh, 550,000 people have been infected. Needless to say that no one is safe until everyone is safe in this inter interconnected world. Therefore, global cooperation and efforts are required to fight with this invisible enemy. I express my deep, deep gratitude for the generous offer of support by the friendly people of Ireland and the government of Ireland for support to Nepal in much needed medical supplies for prevention and treatment of COVID-19 patients in Nepal. We are most grateful for this generosity offered during our difficult time. I'm uh, very much delighted to learn that our humanitarian flight is uh, um, being held uh, next week um, from the government of Ireland through EU um, civil protection mechanism. The Embassy of Nepal is committed to provide pertinent information for the tourists visiting Nepal from Ireland and coordinate with relevant authorities in Nepal to ensure their safety and security. CEO of Nepal Tourism Board, Dr. Dhananjay Regni, has put some ideas um, and uh, some measures that government of Nepal has put forward for the safety and security and for managing the climbing of mount, uh, mountains. 
it would be an exciting um, opportunity for us to attend this program in person. And we look forward to, to see you all in person in Ireland, work together um, for the recovery of tourism sector in post-COVID situation. I would like to uh, congratulate uh, to you to all the uh, Mount Everest submitters again, and I wish all the success of this program. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you, Rashan, for your kind words. And I'd just like to take this opportunity here today as well to thank the embassy for their continued support of the work that we're doing at Nepal Ireland Society. Um, it, it's great to have the support of the embassy and it helps to open up channels, particularly say with um, the Irish aid package going out next week. Um, it, it's, it's good to have the channel there and the communication and the connection. So we thank you for that support. Okay, um, now I'd like to ask Patrick to take the chair, please. Um, Patrick is going to oversee the mountaineering section of the programme. So Patrick, if you could unmute yourself there and- uh, Hi, uh, Alicia, um, sorry. Deputy Sean. Thank you. Oh, sorry, 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 Deputy Sean, my mistake. I missed you, sorry. Um, okay, so we have Deputy Sean Crow to speak next. Um, Deputy Sean is convener of the Ireland and Paul um, Parliamentary Friendship Group. So, Deputy Sean, uh, if you'd like to take the floor there, please. Uh, good morning, and uh, namaste to everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to take part in today's uh, Mount Everest uh, uh, event. And uh, uh, I'd like to extend my regards to uh, all the distinguished guests and those contributing to the meeting today. I'm chair, as I've explained, of the Oireachtas Ireland Nepal Friendship Group. Uh, it's, it's made up of uh, representatives from both houses of the Irish Parliament and uh, made up of all parties and none. Uh, can I express my admiration, uh, begin by expressing my admiration, uh, particularly to all those who have reached the summit of uh, Mount Everest, but also to all those who took part in the challenge of uh, uh, climbing the, uh, Mount Everest and uh, well done to you all. Uh, I think we all know of, uh, you're a small group, but we all know of someone who have, has made that, that, uh, that attempt. Uh, today is rightly a day of um, celebration, but also of reflection. And I think it's right and only proper that we remember those who lost their lives. But we also uh, need to, I'd like to expand my uh, best wishes uh, to all those who took part in down through the years in, uh, in taking part in the challenge of Mount Everest. Uh, I think it's also important that today we express our solidarity and support with the Nepalese people. Uh, particularly at this time, uh, and particularly those who are in frontline position, those frontline workers, uh, those who are in hospital at the moment, uh, and particularly their families, uh, and all of those who have uh, lost their lives to COVID. Uh, the Nepalese people have a huge mountain to climb, and uh, I'm glad that Irish aid and the Irish people have shown uh, such generosity and support uh, in, in this time of, uh, of need. It's clearly um, life-saving support that uh, is being given uh, to the Nepalese people. So it's good use of Irish taxpayers' money and it has the overwhelming support of Irish people um, for, for, for Irish aid itself. I want to thank today's organiser and urge people listening to um, to get involved, to use your contacts uh, you have to support the, the, the people of Nepal, particularly in this time of uh, great need. Uh, they need equipment uh, and resources to tackle the mountain. As I say, they, they have to climb in relation to COVID. But um, I've no doubt that people have been generous up to now and will continue with that generosity. Enjoy, enjoy your day of celebration and reflection and uh, best wishes from all in Ireland. Good Thanks very much, uh, Deputy Sean. Apologies there for missing you out on my list. No, you can't. Anxious to hear from all the summiteers. Um, but I, I would like to thank you on behalf of the Nepal Ireland Society and the people of Nepal for the help that you've given us in trying to get this Irish aid package um, out next week. You, you, uh, you've been a tremendous help to the, the whole um, effort to, to get uh, med medications and, and equipment out there. So we thank you for that. 
Okay, so this time we're definitely moving to Patrick. Um, Patrick, if you'd like to take the floor, please, and uh, introduce some of our summiteers. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Alison. You uh, you woke me up with a start there. Um, uh, thank you for in, uh, for this um, gathering for joining us today. Um, my name is Patrick O'Sullivan, and I represent Mountaineering Ireland on on the Nepal Ireland Society committees. Um, with with eight of the fourteen eight thousand meter peaks in the world in Nepal. It is, it is uh, appropriate that Mountaineering Ireland should support the Nepal, our Nepali friends, and particularly at this time when, when, the, when the country is under such a threat from COVID. And many of uh, our more than 13,000 members uh, in Mountaineering Ireland have been to Nepal on their trip of a lifetime and brought back uh, lasting memories of the, the wonderful mountains and people there. For myself, I worked in Nepal for five years as a medical doctor in the 1980s. That sounds a long time ago now. Uh, I ran a clinic for Save the Children in the Midwest of Nepal, where we saw 300 children a day, sometimes, often. Uh, but some of the best times I remember have, were when I ran the Himalayan Rescue Association clinic up at Fariche in the Everest area. Uh, Preacher is in the Solukumbu, uh, and I was there for five months. It's at a height of just over 14,000 feet or 4,400 meters. And, uh, and it, it was just a wonderful place to be, surrounded by the wonderful mountains up there and right next to the beautiful mountain Amadablan. Um, it's two days below Everest Base Camp, and uh, it was just a wonderful place. Uh, my pleasant task today is to introduce the Irish Everest Summiteers who have been able to, uh, to join us today for our Everest celebrations. We are very pleased and grateful that so many of them have been able to join us. Um, the first uh, person to, that I have to introduce is Dawson Stelfox, and Dawson really needs no introduction to this audience. Uh, an architect from Belfast, Dawson made the first Irish ascent of Everest in 1990, 1993 from the northern or Tibetan side. And, and Dawson went on from there to be chairperson of a group of con conservation architects in Belfast. He has continued to be involved in mountaineering in Ireland and abroad as a guide and by supporting Mountaineering Ireland particularly in encouraging young people to find a safe path into our sport. He has been president of Mountaineering Ireland uh, and has been chair of the Mountain Training Board of Ireland, an all-Ireland body now that's just been set up in recent years. And he remains, I think, a board member of Mountaineering Ireland. He has continued to support our Nepali friends through INET, the I I Irish Nepal Nepalese educational trust uh, using his architectural skills for their benefit. Uh, he's going to talk to us today about the Everest Reconnaissance Expedition of 1921 and the Irish involvement in that expedition. Uh, Dawson. Um, thank you and uh, I need to share the screen um, obviously so if, um, if whatever whatever needs to be done for me to um, to share uh, the screen, that's uh, possible. You can still really share now. Yeah, okay. keep going. Okay, um, so can I just check with somebody that, that the screen is shared? No, not yet. Did you try again? Right, it's showing up on mine as if it's um, coming up. No? No, nothing yet, Dawson. Okay. Um. So yes, it's coming up now. Yeah, it's coming now. I've got it now? Okay, good. Yeah, that's it, it's up.
Okay, um, thanks everybody. Um, uh, Frank Nugent and I gave uh, a talk about the Everest Reconnaissance Expedition a few weeks ago on Mount Nairn Island, and that took about two hours. Um, so you'd be glad to know I'm doing a very brief summary um, of that um, today. Um, and I suppose in particular, given, given it is today, I want to stress, I suppose, that from the very start of attempts to find and climb um, Everest, um, both Irish people and Nepalese people were involved, even though all those early attempts were from the Tibetan side. And I'll explain that uh, a bit more uh, as we go on. Uh, so very briefly, obviously, um, uh, finding Everest um, started way back in the early 1800s with the setting up the Great Trigonometrical Survey, the Survey of India. Uh, by 18, 1854, um, it was recognized that there was this mountain um, buried in amongst the at the Himalayan chain, which was a thousand feet higher than anything else. And it was named after St. George Everest, former surveyor general of India, um, who had never wanted the mountain to be named after him. Um, but at that stage, neither of the local names, Shumalumba from the north or um, Sagamartha from Nepal, uh, were known. Um, such was the remoteness um, of the mountain. So it became known as Everest um, and, and ever since. And where the Irish connection comes in um, is through this man, Charles Hardbury, um, Irish aristocrat, soldier, traveler, diplomat. Uh, and he was involved in the very early stages of promoting the idea of an expedition and offering to go out to India and out to Tibet to help find the way uh, and route through that. His Irish connection, his, his final house was in uh, Belvedere House in Mullingar, um, and in fact, the librarian of um, Westmeath County Council, Marion Heaney. Um, has uh, written extensively about him. There's a lot more, uh, I suppose, of, in both of the archives in uh, Westmeath about Hardbury um, and in the Alpine Club archives um, in London. Um, but it was it was this idea that you know it was take our minds back to the start of the 20th century. Uh, the North Pole and the South Pole had been reached, and the idea of Everest as the third pole, um, which needed to be um, climbed. Um, but at that stage, um, getting access to the mountain was really difficult. But Tibet was very difficult access. Nepal at that stage completely closed off to foreigners um, coming in. Um, but Hardbury was involved at the very start, as I say, in exploring and pushing for the idea of an expedition to Sir Francis' young husband, then president of the Royal Geographical um, Society. Um, and Hardbury traveled out of his own expense and to the Himalaya, meeting up with Sir Charles Bell, who was the political officer uh, with very good contacts to the 13th Dalai Lama um, based in, in, uh, in Tibet, obviously that stage. And interesting enough, Bell uh, was the, the first person we know of in a way um, to advise Hardbury to use Nepalese Sherpas uh, as porters and supporters on the expression of the preference um, to Tibetans. Uh, and so um, the Nepalese, the Sherpa people, Osha people on that sort of trans-Himalayan boundary uh, zone across from Sikkim into, um, into Nepal and on into India. The, ne the Nepalese Sherpas, Oshas, were involved from the very start, the very first Everest reconnaissance expedition. I'll talk more about that as we go along. So here were these were the, the Western members of the Everest reconnaissance expedition. Uh, we have two Irish links here, not just one, um, because as well as um, uh, Hardbury, second from the left in that shot, also, Oliver Wheeler, who was one of the principal um, map makers, surveyors, uh, was um, his father was Irish, who had emigrated to Canada, uh, and Oliver grew up in Canada, um, but with an Irish Irish parents um, and and uh, carrying on Irish collections. And Wheeler was one of the instrumental um, people in mapping the whole Everest area, including uh, down into the Nepalese side from what they could see uh, from uh, Tibet. So the two surveyors, Henry Morshead, um, the Indian Survey Department, using what was then sort of nearly the old fashioned way of plane table surveying. But don't forget these people are going into an area, an area where there's no maps, there's no detailed information um, at all. Um, but our, our, our claim, I say, Edward Oliver Wheeler, um, uh, Father Arsh, uh, he developed, and his father developed this photographic surveying techniques where they used cameras on tripods linked to theodolites which were able to map big areas of, of very rough and wild country uh, with, at a, in a much quicker period. And it was Wheeler in particular um, who uh, was instrumental in mapping these very large areas of unknown um, territory. 
Um, this is just an extract from one of their maps. And you'll notice in this stage, Nepal is a blank to the south. So no foreign surveyors have been allowed in. There were no maps of the mountain areas um, of Nepal. And it was a mystery still. And, and the whole area was a mystery as these people were going in. So if you imagine 100 years ago, going into an area which is unmapped, unknown, um, and even the very um, knowledge of whether or not you could survive at the altitudes up in these mountains was unknown to science. It wasn't until the 1940s um, with pressure chamber um, uh, experiments was it known that it was physically, physiologically possible um, for people to survive up at the extreme altitudes. So they're, they're, the, the, this whole expedition is about going into the unknown. And obviously, culturally um, amazing um, as well. This is Shigarzong Monastery, 1921, over 400 monks. Shigarzong is sort of at the uh, due north of Everest, and it's where the expedition started to turn south um, to go down. So Shigarzong, 400 monks there. These are some of the photographs from that expedition um, of the monks there. And crucially as well, there were very long-standing and deep-seated links across the Himalayas from the from uh, Tibet into Nepal and the, um, the Buddhist people in the, the northern valleys uh, of Nepal, um, particularly later on in Ting Tingbochi uh, Monastery. But those trading links, pilgrimage routes, connectivity was happening long before any of the Westerners came to, uh, came to this area. Those links were established across very high passes and very inhospitable um, ground. And that was the monastery and we were there in 1993, largely destroyed by the Chinese in the 1960s uh, and really just a ruin uh, at this stage. So it was at this point that the, um, the expedition then turned back south towards the main, main Himalayan chain. This is the chain, this is the Pang La, one of the passes between Shigarzong and, and Tingri, heading back uh, southwards towards um, the Everest area. And, now. and a bit of a close up on the map, um, so Tingri across the Pangla into up into the Rongbuk Valley on the northern side. And you can see this area, this is Nepal down in here, still at this stage, a blank, uh, nobody quite knowing exactly what, that, what was there. Um, Rongbuk Monastery, um, uh, this is a pilgrimage site for, for a long time, but the monastery itself had only been built about 1902. Um, Everest North Face in the background, but interestingly enough, again, these, these long-standing links to Tengbochi in Nepal established pilgrimage and trading routes over the high passes. So the people of the northern valleys um, of, the, of, of, uh, of Nepal um, were very connected through to the people in the southern uh, and on the southern end of Tibet uh, up against Everest and, and right along the Himalayan um, chain. So those connections were, were there and established both, say, for trading and for pilgrimage um, reasons. So interesting enough then, this is Mallory and Bullock, two of the, um, the climbers on the uh, 1921 expedition, George Mallory, obviously, um, going up the foot of the Rumbut Glacier in 1921, and our shot from the same place in 1993, still the base camp that expeditions on the northern side um, would use. Um, and um, then we have the, sorry, let's go back one, um, that's Charles Hardbury's photograph of the Rumbut Glacier in 1921, looking it up, uh, looking up to, so that's the, the West Ridge of Everest and the Nepal-Tibet border along the skyline there. And the same view uh, from Frank's um, um, expedition to Changsi in 1987, and looking up the same view uh, to the Nepalese-Tibetan um, uh, border along that, uh, that crest. And what Mallory and Bullock did were looking for the way to go and try and find Everest. And they didn't find it this time around, um, but they, find, they moved on up the, the, the glacier and they got, um, which is probably now the first recorded views into the Western Coombe of Everest. So here we see on this map, for the first time appearing the Nepalese side of Everest, you've got what's called the Western Coombe, Coombe being a Welsh word, obviously, uh, not a Nepalese word. Um, coming from Mallory and, and, and others having association with the Welsh mountains and using a borrowed Welsh word to describe the valley here and no one ever since um, as the, the western Coombe of ever. So the normal Nepalese route obviously comes up Coombe ice of Glacier up into the icefall here up into the western Coombe uh, up to the call, south call between Lhotse 
um, on Everest and that. And this was the first glimpse that Westerners had had of, of this area, but with no access into it from the very steep cliffs on the West Ridge uh, and down here. So they, they decided no practical route to Everest from this side um, at the time. What they missed was the East Rumba Glacier, which eventually became the Northern Standard Northern Route, but they, they immediately thought there's no way, easy way up uh, from this side. So they moved, uh, they, they, they sort of missed that and they moved round to the, um, the Carta uh, side, the Carta Valley. But, but here looking up, so this is the Rumbuk Valley. Up at the head of the valley, you can see Primori. Now I obviously uh, climb frequently from Nepal, one of the main mountains in the Kumbu Valley of Nepal, but you can see the, like, the geographical proximity um, to the Nepalese mountains from the head of the Rumbuk. Um, that's here. So that's Primori. Um, but more interestingly, most of the load carrying, most of the reporters here were not Tibetans, but they were Sherpa and Bosha um, porters. So Nepalese um, living in Nepal quite often coming over the mountains and say that transboundary movement was quite um, quite frequent. Um, and that bottom shot there is another is a Mallory shot looking up um, to, to Everest above Changse. But they found no way up in there. So the expedition moved around to the Karta Valley on the east side of Everest, trying to find a way up to the North Call um, from there. Um, and on the way, they, got, they took this uh, lovely shot of Pathankste. Um, again, first climbed, in, not until 1954, by a New Zealand party with a Sherpa from the Nepalese um, side. But again, they were right on the border here between Nepal and Tibet. Out to the right, there is Lutse. Um, uh, and, they, and then further around to the right, you've got the east face or the Kanchung face um, of Everest, South Kong and, and then Everest. Um, so what that expedition did is it tried to find its way up uh, to the North Call over from the Carter Valley from the eastern side, which involved climbing over a very high pass, the Lakpala, uh, about 23,000 feet uh, or so. Um, and they spent a few weeks doing that, finding their way up to there, eventually to this camp on the Lakpala. Um, and from there, they were able to look across to the North Call, Shangla. Um, and this is, um, again, hard beauty photograph, 1921, uh, with the blue circles showing there where they camped before heading up to the North Call. And remember, and, and that's the way back to the Lakpala. So that's the way they came over from the, from the Carta side. But remember, this was a, a reconnaissance expedition, and the intention of it was to find a way to Everest. But they were told that they could uh, make an attempt on the mountain uh, if uh, conditions allowed them. And Mallory, in particular, was determined to make an attempt to get at least as far uh, as the North Call. Um, they'd made life difficult for themselves. Obviously, they, they'd missed this East Rumbuk Glacier, come over that high pass into this area, camped about here um, on the glacier. And so by the time they got this far, They'd already been, uh, they left in, uh, they left Darjeeling in May, and this is September at this stage. So they've already been living in, you know, extreme conditions for um, three or four months at this stage. Um, and they come over 23,000 foot pass, dropping down into the Rumbo Glacier, and then faced with um, climbing up to the, the North Call. Nowadays, the, this route, which was discovered by Wheeler, as I say, our, our honorary Irishman, um, that's the route used by every expedition um, out to the north side um, since uh, then. So what they were faced with was the, uh, the North Call, um, and it was climbed, uh, first climbed by Mallory Bullock and Wheeler with three Sherpas. Unfortunately, they're not named in the records, so we don't know um, who they were. Um, but um, uh, then they were they uh, they climbed up to the North Call and made the first ascent up to the North Call and that's that opening up of the route on the north side um, is um, is really the the big achievement of that reconnaissance expedition and the North Call is not easy um, it's a steep climb um, it's avalanche prone and tragically in 1922 seven uh, Sherpas Nepali Sherpas were killed uh, on the North Call it's a difficult climb even today. Um, getting up. And of course, like all glaciers and ice falls, it changes um, frequently. It's unstable. <laughs> but what it takes you to then is the opening up of the North Ridge of Everest. And that's our shot from 1993 with the North Ridge stretching up on the left hand side uh, on up to the, um, on up to the, the meet the, uh, the Northeast Ridge and then up towards um, the summit with the first and second steps high up on that 
um, that ridge. Um, and that was as far as they went in 1921. That was as far more than they were expected um, to get. They'd found the route up into the North Ridge and there followed then a series of expeditions um, in the pre-war years, uh, right up until the Second World War, um, trying to climb this route. And none of those expeditions were successful uh, with obviously, obviously Mallory and Irvine uh, disappearing in 1924 on the route. And it was only post Second World War then that Nepal opened up to uh, foreigners coming in again, to Westerners coming in. And obviously all the attention then shifted to the Southern side, to the Nepalese side of Everest. And it wasn't until much later that um, the, the Northern side became open up again to, uh, to Western climbers um, to go in. So the big achievement of that 1921 expedition is say Irish involved, Nepalese involved right from the start was that they found the mountain, they mapped it, they found the easiest routes up to it. Uh, they discovered the existence of the Western Coombe on the Nepalese side, which then triggered the exploration of the Nepalese side post-war when that was possible. And they produced these very, very detailed and accurate maps of a completely unknown um, area. So uh, an enormously, is arguably the most successful of all the pre-Second World War um, expeditions uh, led by an Irishman, which we're very proud of from Mongar. The story still lives on. He only died in 1967, so it's quite a recent, uh, right, recent history, uh, really. Um, and I suppose all of us Irish climbers are determined to keep that bit of the story uh, alive. But in, in particular for today, I, I suppose it, it forges that connection between uh, mountaineers and the Nepali people um, right from the very start of the exploration of that. You want to know more? Three excellent books um, on the original book, um, Reconnaissance, Wade Davis's Into the Silence, and then a much broader book which tells you a lot more about the Nepalese side and the mapping and exploring of that, Michael Ward, who was one of the members of the 1953 um, expedition as well. So I'd recommend all those three books. And thank you for giving me this. I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's, not, a, it's not a short story, so it's taken me a few months to go through it, but it gives a, given that this is the centenary, um, of the very first reconnaissance expedition, it seems the right time to be marking that connection between those at early Irish involvement and the Nepalese involvement on Everest, Shomlunga, Sagamartha. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Dawson. That's uh, great. Uh, you're, it's appropriate today to mention that early involvement of the Irish and the Nepalese in, in explorations of of Everest, so we uh, thank you for highlighting all that. Our next uh, summit here is Pat Felvey, and we're grateful to Pat for, he's very busy, but we're grateful to him for joining us today. Um, Pat uh, also needs uh, very little introduction, but uh, Pat is an adventurer, a mountaineer, and a polar explorer from Cork and he made the second Irish ascent of Everest from the north side in 1995. He climbed Everest for a second time in 2004 by the southeast ridge from Nepal uh, when he was accompanied, or he was with uh, Claire O'Leary who was making the first uh, uh, ascent for, by an Irish woman. Uh, Pat was uh, uh, the first Irish person to complete the seven summits and the first uh, person in the world to do it twice. So uh, I'll hand over to you, Pat. Thanks very much. Thanks, Padraig, and hi to everybody and regards here from Killarney. Lovely day here, uh, you know, it's a pity we can't get out, but uh, I'm on my way up to Atlow now. But I just want to say, look, thank you very much to everybody. I see lots of friends here, you know, on the webinar today. And to me, Everest uh, was an amazing opportunity. It was a dream, and it was a dream that actually changed all my life. I've got to be very short because of the fact I know there's a lot of people speaking there, but I think any of us that have been privileged in relation to standing on what is no doubt, right, okay, you know, the metaphor for people, trials and tribulations in life, you know, because everybody has an Everest. So I just want to say, like, for me, it changed my life. Um, it was after a period, a very rough period in my life that, um, that I had a dream to stand on the top of this. I was very fortunate that I was following in the footsteps of Hillary and Tenz, or, or of Marion Irvin, and of course Dawson and his team 
for, uh, you know, here in Ireland. So it gave me a great privilege and a great bit of knowledge that when I got out there on the second attempt, yes, I did fail on the first attempt. Uh, one of our teammates died, you know, just when we were two days from the summit and we came back. But again, I went out. And what it did for me is it showed me like that I was an apprentice that became a master. And when I stood on the top of Mount Everest, I came back talking like this and in turn, like, you know, encouraged other people that I wanted to help to get there. And I did get a second chance with uh, Claire O'Leary, uh, with Jar McDonnell and uh, Mike Murphy. And I had a great privilege. I've been 60 times to Nepal. What an amazing place uh, between Nepal and Tibet. So I've done lots and lots of stuff out there. It's my spiritual home. I just want to say thank you to everybody. I know that everyone that stood here, just to think of the fact that we stood for a small part of time in the history of our planet, no matter when you stood there, you were the highest people on planet Earth. And to think, and this, what it means to me, that the power of this place that came from the bottom of our seabeds, that we stood on top of the world and said, yes, we have done it. We're standing on top of the world. And I say that, you know, as a, a proud Nori, because I'd have been told, like, who do you think you are to come from a council estate that you could do this? Uh, a proud Corkman, a proud Irishman, and a proud to be part of this fraternity, this tribe of Irish people, and to be part of a community with the Nepalese people and, uh, you know, the Nepalese association here. And I just said, thank you very much. And I'm going to have to go now, but I'm going to try to pick it up on, uh, like, in the car on my way up. So thanks a lot. And by the way, namaste. And, you know, you all have the power. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Pat uh, Danibat, as they say in uh, Nepal. Um, that's uh, great. And thank you for joining us. I, as I say, you are very busy. We're going to go a bit off program just now uh, uh, because one of other, our other participants has to uh, to leave shortly as well. So I'm going to introduce Derek Mann, uh, who's a Dubliner who works in the financial sector. And he summited on Everest in 2014 uh, by the, the Northeast Ridge from Tibet. Uh, he's also completed the seven summits, I think. And uh, so I'd like to now hand over to Derek and ask him to say a few words. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Patrick, and uh, thank you, everyone, um, for the opportunity to attend. Um, I'd like to uh, pass congratulations on to Alison and Deepesh for organizing this event and getting so many people together um, to share and uh, help with the Nepalese situation as we face. Um, yes, I, I summited, I was lucky to summit back in 2014. Um, I was on the Seven Summits uh, expedition led by Noel at the time. And uh, I must say, I had an absolutely wonderful time. I was asked uh, only the other day, would I go back? And uh, within a heartbeat, I certainly would. Um, I really enjoyed Nepal, Kathmandu, and uh, seeing all the scenes and scenery, wonderful scenery out on the Tibetan side also. Um, the, uh, I think that's really about it. I say, I just wish everyone well. And uh, I know there's a lot more people to speak and uh, it's lovely to see everybody. And it's uh, certainly, um, Alison and uh, Deepesh, you have my full support and anything I can do to help and uh, keep the community together and the alumni, you know, forming is a great idea. So I wish you all well. Thanks, Mila. Thanks very much, Derek. Uh, thanks for your commitment. Uh, that sounds great. Um, so we'll go back on track now. And the next person I'd like to introduce is Noel Hanna. Again, he won't need much introduction, but I am going to say my words because uh, I don't get anyone to listen otherwise. But um, so Noel is a professional adventurer and a bodyguard. He has climbed Everest now 10 times with the this recent ascent. And uh, the first ascent was in 2006 from the Northeast, from, from, from the Northeast Ridge from Tibet. He climbed K2 in 2018 and uh, was turned back uh, earlier this year, he turned back from an attempt to climb K2 in winter uh, by, by very high winds, I think. Uh, he has climbed the seven summits, setting himself the challenge of racing under his own power from the summits to the nearest uh, piece of sea. And he's the first to do that. 
and in 2000, the one he uh, is very proud of, I think, is in 2017, he made the first ascent of Burke Kang at 6,942 meters in Nepal. And I know that gave you a special pleasure. So, so Noel, if you want to say a few words, thank you very much. Hi, Patrick and everybody else that's on the chat today. Thanks very much for inviting me. And uh, I didn't know if I was going to be back home here to be part of this talk today, but it's great that I got home a couple of days ago and, and part of the talk. Uh, I would just say, yes, Nepal has a lot of other smaller peaks, which is equally, if not more challenging uh, than Everest. So yes, go out, try smaller peaks before you head to Everest. And I would just like to ask Dawson, uh, did the Irish team summit chancy in, in the late 80s? I, I don't know. I was there. I climbed it in 2011 and I climbed it in 2013, my chancy. So uh, uh, it'd be interesting to see if the other Irish team made summit in the late 90s. But just yeah, everybody, I, thank I, I, you. I, I, I'll answer you immediately, Noel, just to put you out of your suspense then. No, they didn't. Uh, they climbed oh. a, good bit, a good, bit up right. the, um, good bit up the ridge from the North Col, but didn't get to the summit. Right. I don't know if there's been many Irish people who's climbed Chansey before. Uh, I had the opportunity in 2011 for a reconnaissance job for the Red Bull base jump that happened in 2013. Uh, but yes... Get out to Nepal. It's a great country. There's great other peaks out there, and just everybody enjoy the mountains. And and hopefully everybody will be getting back to the mountains, even if it's in Ireland or Northern Ireland this year. Uh, the mountains are free for everybody to go to, enjoy. Short and that's, sweet. That's great. Thanks very much. No, uh, you're you're very kind and. Uh, 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 you with so many firsts, uh, very uh, modest as well, I think. Um, I, I might just move on as we seem to be uh, running a bit behind schedule. So the next summit here I want to introduce is Dr. Nigel Hart, who is a Belfast GP and a Queen's University lecturer. He climbed Everest in 2007 from the southeast on the southeast ridge uh, from Nepal on the medical research expedition, which we've already heard about uh, from Paul Devaney and uh, Devaney. And we, uh, he was, they were researching into the effects of altitude and hypoxia. And uh, uh, as Paul has already said, they did do take blood samples on the balcony at 8,400 meters, which is probably the highest uh, blood samples have been taken. You were intending, I think, to do it on the summit, but, uh, there were some difficulties with that. And uh, last year, uh, in, the, in the, the spirit of the lockdown and everything else, you repeated the climb in your back garden with a thousand steps a day. So congratulations on that. And we probably need to set up an alumni for that sort of ascent as well. Um, so uh, uh, Nigel, if you want to say a few words. Thanks very much, Patrick. And again, thanks to Alison and Deepesh for setting up today. It's a real privilege to be part of this. And indeed, it's a great privilege to have uh, been in Nepal a number of times, but also to have uh, stepped onto the slopes of and indeed managed to get to the summit of Mount Everest. It's an amazing place. Uh, the Nepalese are an amazing uh, group of people and it's a real privilege to have had the experiences that we have had. Um, I'd also like to echo the, some of the, the words of uh, Dan, uh, Dr. Dunanjay uh, Regmi when he, when he talks about what we need to do about the, the mountains and about the use of the mountains. And I think the word I would think that we all have to take a play a part in here is stewardship, stewardship of this of this wonderful resource, which um, we should not take for granted. Um, and also to say a word about uh, Paul Devaney. Paul, I think you're fast becoming the Miss uh, Elizabeth Hawley of Ireland. Um, uh, anyone who doesn't know about Miss Elizabeth Hawley uh, should look her up, but um, uh, you, you're, you're definitely uh, in, in the role for, uh, for taking on that title. So keep up the good work. It's fascinating just to, to, to trace what, what's been happening. Uh, yes, we were there on, an, uh, on a, um, an expedition really researching into hypoxia. 
Um, and uh, in fact, you know, if anything, COVID-19 and the effects of COVID-19 and the fact that some people end up in hospital often because of hypoxia, which is low oxygen, oxygen in the blood, is exactly the sort of thing that we want to know more about. Uh, and there's still much to learn. Our knowledge of the physiological uh, adaptations to hypoxia are still scratching the surface. Um, everyone knows that you breathe faster, that your heart beats faster, that you accumulate more red blood cells and more hemoglobin. Um, but that's all about transport of oxygen. And the real magic in, in um, acclimatization is in how your body utilizes very scarce oxygen um, uh, um, at, the, down at, the, at, at the tissues. In fact, when we took the sample of blood, uh, or numerous samples of blood just on the balcony, yes, we were planning to do it on the summit, but it was too windy to set up camp there and start taking samples of blood. It, it turned out that day from um, exposed bits of growing. Um, we came down onto the balcony, which is still pretty high to be undertaking such, a, uh, such a, 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 an investigation. Um, the lowest sample um, from, from, that, from, from that group who, who gave samples of blood, if we took a sample of blood from your artery at, at sea level right now, it, the, the, the result would uh, give 13 kilopascals of oxygen, 13 kilopascals. Um, and on that day, uh, on the 23rd of May 2007, the lowest was 2.55 kilopascals, which is unbelievable. And that is what we need to know more about because in the case of people entering hospital and having to go to ICU because of hypoxia, because of COVID-19, if we were able to rapidly um, acclimatize someone, turn on the genes that make your, 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 the tissues of your body um, more adapted to low levels of oxygen, then perhaps um, we would have more people would have survived um, uh, COVID-19. So it is a very contemporary um, um, uh, and, and immediate um, uh, concern that, that we were conducting the, the research for. Um, and in, in the line of that, we also had the opportunity to, to climb, uh, to climb uh, Everest, and indeed it was a, a real privilege. And I'll just finish off by saying, uh, mountains are, uh, I echo many of the comments and Pat Falvey was saying, mountains are a, a wonderful um, wilderness for us to, to go to. And particularly, I, I echo the words of um, uh, Robert McFarlane, when he talks about the mountains challenge our complacent conviction the world that the world has been made for humans by humans. Uh, mountains induce a modesty in us. And indeed, I, I always feel a great modesty to be standing uh, in the wonderful nature of the middle of the mountains. I know we're better to do that in Nepal. And I hope it's not too long before I get the opportunity to be back there among um, our wonderful Nepalese uh, uh, brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nigel. That's a uh, very interesting talk and uh, uh, from the 1980s when I was in Pariche we were using a, a diving chamber to repressurize people and that was the very early days of research and it has come on quite a lot since then uh, but uh, and just taking blood samples up at 8,400 meters that sounds pretty amazing. Anyway we'll move on to uh, to uh, one of your partners, in fact, Dr. Roger McMorrow, who was also on that expedition and also climbed Everest in 2007 from Nepal side. Uh, Roger is a, an ethetist from Dublin, and uh, and uh, I, I've uh, probably already preempted all the things I could say about him, but he took part in this research expedition to uh, to look into the effects of altitude on, on people and, uh, and to look into particularly hypoxia, the hypoxia of high altitude. And uh, uh, so I'll hand over to Roger now to say a few words. Thank you, Roger. Uh, is Roger on the um, It doesn't look like Roger is online. Um, so right. uh, Patrick, so let's move to Ian. Right, uh, thanks very much. I'm sorry, uh, uh, yes, thank you. So yes, so we have Ian Taylor now. Um, moving on, uh, Ian uh, climbed Everest in 2008 again from Nepal. He was uh, then, if he doesn't mind me saying, he was then 29 years old. And at that stage was the youngest Irishman to have, to have reached the top of Everest. 
Uh, since then, he's moved on and developed a, a hugely successful travel company, uh, taking people trekking it all around the world, really. And uh, they, they also, uh, I think, climb up to 20,000 uh, meter, 20,000 feet peaks. Uh, uh, um, so, um, Ian, I hand over to you now. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be short. I think the short and sweet. So I think uh, I'm speaking from 8,000 feet up in the Rocky Mountains. So it's a privilege to be with you. Um, yeah, I think it, look, Everest was a game changer for me back in the day. And I think I, we've been super lucky to, um, to uh, be able to move here, to live in the mountains uh, and to go back to Nepal. I mean, I've been to base camp over, I think over 40 times now, uh, climbed on the mountain on the north side south side spent plenty of time there um over the last i suppose 17 years ago when i went there first but we've had the privilege of hiring some staff in nepal so we have like eight full-time staff on the ground um i think we've raised over a hundred thousand dollars for projects we built just finished our second school in the pandemic um and actually helped one of our staff set up his own business uh supplying earthquake preventive bricks for for buildings that they're putting into the mountains so um i think we've raised about $18,000 for our staff um, in the pandemic. And we have been able to go back to Nepal, but, um, you know, we hope to get back there. Well, we'll see. <laughs> We're hoping that uh, the government give us some some options um, over the coming months in terms of just allowing certain, certain elements of the community back in. Um, namely people that are vaccinated, hopefully that, you know, we're maskless here in the US right now. For anyone that's vaccinated so we can go everywhere we want um, without masks which is great but that hasn't spread across Ireland or um, to Nepal or anywhere else so um, I suppose the work that you guys are trying to do is super important as you kind of look to the future of Nepal um, I mean government strategy is something we can't control but what you can control is look at uh, you know what the plan is for for ever summiteers um, Irish ever summits here and what you plan for them to do. Um, you know, I like the idea of getting people together, but it's using the skill sets that everybody has um, to kind of push this thing forward. Um, and I think an online strategy is something you guys need to really start looking at. Um, I mean, we have a thousand people a day on our website. Um, we've raised over almost a million for projects in Africa. So there's, there's, just through online work. So hopefully there's a, a strategy or a business plan almost around um, what you guys are trying to do. Uh, I suppose getting people on here is great, but you know, utilizing their skill sets is probably more valuable, whether it's through the government, through media, um, whether it's all the skills that all of us have developed over the last number of years. So um, that would be my challenge is that if you want to really help in Nepal, then we need to have some sort of a strategy um, and it should be online. If you wanna reach people all over the world uh, with good content, with good information, you gotta get it online and do it, uh, do it quick. Um, it's worked really well for us and it's kind of uh, really just grown our business over the last you know, eight years. Um, I'm happy to help uh, give any insight that I've learned um, over the last decade and um, yeah, um, thank you for having me. And uh, Alison, uh, feel free to reach out anytime. And anyone that needs anything, always happy to help. Great, thanks very much, Ian. That's uh, very insightful. Uh, a challenge to us in our uh, in, with our new organisations here in uh, in Ireland. Um, so I'll, I'll move on then now to to the next summit here and this uh, we have to revisit the Hannah household I think uh, because the next summit here was Lynn Hannah who uh, who uh, climbed Everest for the first time in 2009 from the northeast and uh, she subsequently climbed Everest for a second time in 2016 I think from the Nepal side on both occasions uh, Noel was with her and um, and so they they became the uh, first married couple 
Uh, so amongst the records they hold, uh, they became the first married couple to climb Everest from both sides. Uh, Lynn also climbed Manuslu in 2019, uh, 8,163 meter peak, uh, without oxygen that time with Noel again. And uh, so she's the first Irish woman to climb an 8,000 meter peak without oxygen. So Lynn, if you want to say a few words, thank you very much. Thanks, for, thank you. Thank you everyone uh, for staying on. Um, it's not easy to get through all the summer tears. As the first woman to speak today, I'm waiting for the others to come on board. And um, yes, uh, we've climbed a lot of uh, mountains together and we're still married. I think that's a good sign that you can uh, climb Everest as a husband and wife and still be married. And um, it's been wonderful on both occasions to, to summit Mount Everest, I think, uh, for anyone um, at the dreams of climbing Everest, it's fantastic we will stand on the summit. I still have a, a challenge in mind and uh, obviously to summit Everest without uh, the use of supplemental oxygen, who knows if I'll get the opportunity to do that. And it'd be lovely to do it with Noel, of course. And um, to remain as a married couple too, and not, not of any fallouts. Um, the only funny thing that ever happened to us was Noel doesn't like me bringing anything pink to the mountain. As a woman, I always like to have my tent embellished with all things pink. So for me, um, you've got to stay as feminine as you can in the environment that is Everest and always remember to bring some fun to the whole thing. We joined Nigel last year and we did uh, the Everest on our step here in South Africa and um, I have continued even though Noel left and went to K2 and went back to Everest, I have continued to maintain my step that I started and actually it's really added to my level of fitness I have to be honest and it's helped with my running because I'm a runner at heart so Nigel, thank you for that challenge. We enjoyed every minute of it and we got plenty of our friends here in South Africa on board too. So there's always a challenge you can set yourself even in, even in COVID lockdown. But thank you for the opportunity from both of us uh, down in South Africa. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much, Lynn. And uh, yes, it is good that you and Noel are still, uh, still <laughs> happy and smiling uh, within a short distance of each other at this yes. time so thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, the next summiteer is uh, Basil Gagan who uh, who summited Everest in 2011 from the Nepal side. Uh, Basil is a Dubliner uh, but now he works in London in the financial sector and uh, he's set to become I think the chair of the Dublin Airport Authority in shortly so uh, Basil I'll hand over to you to say a few words. Uh, is Basil online? Um, I don't see the name there. Uh, maybe uh, we move on to uh, Kim. All right, uh, sorry about that. But uh, anyway, uh, another high achiever, Basil. Uh, Kian, Kian uh, is, uh, uh, Kian O'Bulacon uh, was uh, from Dublin, but I think he's now living in Australia maybe. And uh, he climbed Everest in 2012 from the Nepali side. Uh, he's a professional mountaineer and a director of World Sherpas now. Uh, he's a guide and he now takes other, other climbers into the greater ranges. Uh, to my knowledge, he's also climbed Choyoyu and Lhotse. So uh, um, Kian, if you want to say a few words there, please. Uh, hello, namaste. How's everyone? Um, yeah, so I, I'm based in Brisbane. It's a bit late over here, but um, yeah, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, great idea. Um, yeah, so I got into mountaineering through my dad uh, in the Wicklow Mountains, and you know it was always my dream to climb Everest, and never thought I'd get the chance. So, you know, there were some Irish mountaineers who helped me along the way. And uh, yeah, luckily enough, I was uh, able to climb Everest in 2012 um, with a great team of Sherpas, Mingma Sherpa, Pasang, um, Chiring, and a few others. Then, um, yeah, after 2012, we, we started a business in Nepal, uh, Santa Himalayas, and worked with the guys there for five years. And some of you might have remembered uh, Pasang Mingma came to Ireland. Um, so, you know, 
we've done some great climbs, you know, after Everest, Bed and Go, a first ascent in uh, Rewalong Valley. And we did um, a solar project after the earthquakes and a water project for some of the villages. And then, um, you know, it was great, all the support from Ireland, all the fundraising done. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, 2017, I climbed Lotse with uh, John Snorri uh, from Iceland, who uh, some of you know from K2 this winter, passed away. And uh, thanks to Noel and Lynn for all your help there, on, and uh, Jason Black as well for your help with the search. Um, so yeah, hopefully after COVID, have lots of uh, projects planned, you know, lots of uh, mountains to climb, looking forward to going back to Nepal and bring some of the Sherpas back to uh, Ireland and Australia. And uh, yeah, so looking forward to getting back out to the mountains and climb with all you guys again and everyone. So. And thanks very much, Kian. Um, and uh, yes, thank you for joining us at whatever time it is down there in Brisbane. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, just with the, yeah, so we we restructured the company and now we're World Sherpas. So it's a, a more global company. And some of the Sherpas are the, the shareholders of the company as well. So we made some changes to travel around different parts of the world. So... Yeah. Thanks very much, Kian. Uh, that's uh, yeah. that's great. We're we're losing you, I think, maybe, or or you finished. But I'll move on anyway to Sean Mooney, who climbed Everest in two thousand and thirteen from the Nepal side. Uh, Sean is Canadian from Winnipeg, but I think now works in the financial sector in London. Um, he, interestingly enough, is also the middleweight chess boxing world champion currently, as and has been so since 2015, and I think fights under the name of Sean the Machine Mooney. So, uh, so uh, with that broad introduction, I'll hand over to Sean. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, and, and thanks to to all the organizers for setting up this event and this network. It's uh, it's an honor to be connected with you all and, and uh, share this same experience. Hopefully when, when the pan, uh, pandemic subsides, we can uh, meet a lot of each other on some mountains somewhere. Um, as, as you mentioned, I'm, I am Canadian. My father uh, grew up in Ireland um, and that's how I, I have my Irish passport and was happy to bring both flags to the, to the summit in 2013. Um, yeah, I think I'll keep it short because of, of all the amazing people I've heard speak today, I think my story is probably uh, uh, a little less experienced and interesting on the mountaineering front. And I'm, I'm excited to hear uh, more of the amazing mountaineers from, from Ireland speak. Yeah, thanks very much, Sean. That was very good and uh, nice to see you there. Um, the next summit here is Jason Black, who we've already heard mentioned for his climb on K2. Um, but uh, Jason is an extreme athlete and he climbed Everest in 2013 from the Tibet side. Um, he, uh, he, he, was, he, claims the first, he claimed the first Irish ascent for a person from Donegal. Uh, he holds many endurance records and, uh, and uh, climbed K2 in 2018 shortly after Noel. So, uh, so I'll hand over to Jason now, if you want to say a few words. Um, Patrick, I think Jason is not here. Um, All right. So we, we can go to John. Right, so, so moving swiftly on, um, the, the joys of virtual meeting. Um, the next summit here to, to mention who, who was able to join us today, we thought, is John Burke, uh, who's from County Clare and uh, um, climbed Everest in 2017 from the Nepal side. Uh, he's, uh, as many people will know, he's a manager of the Amada Spanish Point Hotel and the Hotel Doolin. And uh, he, he has 
numerous other claims in the Alps and in the Himalaya to his under his belt as well, including Amma Dublin in 2016. So I'll hand over to you, John, for a few words. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for thanks for having me part of this event. Um, the mountaineering and and the Everest dream was something. The seeds were sown around 2007. Uh, when I was reading about uh, 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 some of the other climbers that are that are online today, and uh, from that I was kind of set off on this mission to climb Everest. It took me ten years to get there, and I got lots of help from from so many other mountaineers along the way. If I could thank Ian Taylor was the first that I connected with when he was based in La Hinch. Uh, it was soon after his summer when I started to first connect with him. Uh, Paul Devaney gave me lots of advice along the way. Keen became my right hand man on many great climbs and training days. Um, uh, and, and actually my very first day to ever try to climb a mountain about a, a month after reading about Everest I, I, I set off for Carantula I booked a guide through your office Pat, Pat Fabi's office I only got halfway to the top of Carantula that particular day so thankfully I've had more successful days since then I think I'm about 250 summits of Carantula since that day and, uh, and it's become my go-to place and lots of happy memories Everest and the dream and of Everest brought me to all these great places and adventures um, and in particular my time in Nepal. Look, there it is, my office wall and many more pictures beside it uh, has the greatest memories, you know, connecting uh, with Nepal Ireland Society and the Sherpas when they come over and visit. Um, we've some, met some great friends. I just can't wait to get back there again. Um, you know, my, my closest friends are people I've met through mountaineering and, uh, and Nepal and, 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 and the Sherpas that I climb would hold a, a really special place in my heart that I'll never forget. And uh, I hope to always stay linked and connected to Nepal. And I'm delighted to get this opportunity today. Thanks very much, Patrick. Great. Thanks very much, John. That's great to highlight that, uh, that while we go there for the mountains, it's often the memories of the people we meet there in Nepal that we bring back, uh, uh, which uh, stay with us longest, I think. Thanks very much. The next summit here is uh, Rory McHugh who's an Irish Times columnist and who I imagine uh, lives in Dublin, I think. And uh, he climbed Everest in 2017 from the Nepal side. Uh, and he ha holds the world record for the highest Frisbee throw, I'm told. So, so we'll hand over to you, Rory, to say a few words. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, as, as uh, echoing uh, you know, the words of everyone before, it's just a privilege to, to be here today. It's a privilege after the year and a half we've all had just to, to get together and remember some of the good times on the mountains. I guess some people have been away, but some I certainly haven't over the last while. Um, yeah, I mean, being, uh, you know, covering uh, the trip for the Our Times, uh, raising money with them to build some schools in, in, in Nepal, and then, you know, having the opportunity to step on top of the world was was an incredible, uh, you know, uh, feeling and an incredible fortune for, for all of us who've actually managed to, to do it. So I think it's just, it's just brilliant. I think the, the group here today is fantastic. And as uh, I think a couple of you said before, some really fantastic mountaineers, uh, which uh, have been great to listen to. So yeah, uh, keep it going. And uh, I think again on, on Nepal, like I was there a couple of years ago, uh, returning just to do some mountain biking adventure, visit the schools that we had built, and just a real reminder that there's just so much to do out there in Nepal. It isn't just even the mountains. I mean, not only not Everest, not just the mountains, there's some incredible mountain biking, some incredible rafting, some of the world's best rafting, some of the world's best mountain biking, and that's just that's just the sports side. The culture is brilliant. So, yeah, for anyone who wants to get out, all ages, all abilities, it's just a brilliant place, and uh, um, you know, obviously our hearts all go out to everyone who's going through that second wave right now. Cheers, thanks. Great, thanks very much, Rory. And, uh, oh, by the yes. way, I'm trying to get my three-month-old to sleep. <laughs> so it's a bit of bit all hectic, right. <laughs> Yes, no, well, good luck with that, but uh, uh, probably another Everest. But, um, but yes, no, you're good. It's good to highlight the other activities that are available in Nepal, apart from the tourism and the wonderful cultural things. Uh, there also are the uh, wildlife reserves. And uh, uh, so there's there's a huge amount to do, which doesn't even involve really going into the mountains. So thanks very much. Uh, so then we have our last uh, summit here who's been able to join us today. Um, another another of the, the women who have climbed Everest from the women from Ireland who've climbed Everest Jenny Copeland, who 
is one of the more recent uh, summiteers summiting in 2019 uh, uh, from the Nepal side. Uh, drum from Drumree in County Meath, a physiotherapist, and if she doesn't mind me saying, a mother of four, would you believe, and um, and and a climbing instructor. So I imagine you have very you're used to having very full days, Jenny. So so if you want to say a few words now, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Patrick. Thanks, um, Alison and Deepesh for having me. And um, like that, as everyone's kind of reiterated already, it's super to be part of this and it is an absolute privilege to have ever visited Nepal and yeah, to stand on top of Everest was um, a real gem. It was obviously the last year as I got to spend with Shay as well. So just remembering Shay um, today. Um, um, but yeah, it's... Yeah, as a mum, absolutely uh, taking on an adventure or actually fulfilling that dream um, for me is really special. Um, and I think when you have a dream and being able to follow through with that is just something um, yeah, quite amazing. And I think support that I've got from pretty much everybody here today, um, I've met you or talked to you all at some point. Um, and it's just really, really nice to know that um, there is that network. Um, Noel obviously stood on top of the world there with Noel as well. Um, John, Ian, Keen, Paul, all of you um, were brilliant and Derek were really good about um, supporting me and Shay in, in fulfilling that dream. Um, yeah, and Nigel also, I thanks I got out there and did those step challenges with you <laughs> and kept me sane over lockdown, particularly on the first wave that we went through. But yeah, I do um, obviously want to say as well, think, um, thinking of everybody in Nepal um, and this way for them. And I hope that they all get the support that they need. Um, yeah, so it's a super place to go, fulfill your dreams if you have any to step out there, even keeping it at the low level. Um, it's mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing. And like any good adventure book, um, you're actually living it when you're there. So it's, it's great. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Jenny. We'll, we'll move on. Uh because of the pressure of time and um, we were to have a Q&A but we're going to pass that by now and I think I might hand over uh, to, 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 to uh, Dr Jane Fenlon who's a Senior Vice President of the Nepal Island Society and who will, set, will sum up for us now. Thanks very much Jane. Jane are you online? Um... Jenny's on mute. Hey, Jen. Yeah, Jen, you're on mute. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, I didn't realize I was going to have to sum up. <laughs> anyway, look, uh, a vote of thanks because, on behalf of Nepal Ireland Society, I'd really like to thank all of you who spoke today. It was fascinating. I mean, I know a lot about Everest and all the Everest summiteers, but I found every single contribution to be very interesting. And also, of course, the fact that your contribution is in a very worthy cause to raise some funds. And by the way, Dawson and uh, Frank Nugent, I don't know if Frank's listening. Thanks very much. Uh, Dawson and Frank gave a talk and raised funds for the Irish Nepalese Education Trust to play their part and send out donations for uh, COVID protection uh, to the villagers up in Puleli. We, we tend to stay local. And while I'm here and talking about local and so many people really appreciate Nepal and the people, I'd like to mention uh, Pancha Rai, who has summited Everest this week. Now, Pancha is from uh, the village of Rapcha in the Kaku Valley up in the Solo Kumbu. And I met him when I went out to Nepal first. And it, we are so delighted that Pancha has summited Everest. He is only the second person of the Kaling Rai people to have actually summited Everest. And the Kaling Rai have been working, they just get called generic Sherpas, but the Rai people have worked up in base camp on Everest expeditions, you know, for many, many years. And um, really, that's all I want to say. Just go to Nepal, meet the people, 
and enjoy, enjoy. Thank you. Namaste. Thanks very much, Jane. Um, just to, to sum up before we finish up, um, I think listening to all the ever summiteers speaking today, there's a huge affinity felt throughout the climbing community towards Nepal. And it's, it's very, very obvious in the way that people speak so fondly about the country and what they've experienced there and, um, you know, to encourage people to go there. So just if we're to take anything out of today um, and what we're trying to do at Nepal Ireland Society and setting up this alumni network, I, I mentioned it when I, when I started uh, earlier on, but, you know, the difficulties in getting in touch with people are, are kind of holding us back a little bit. So if any of you have any contact details with anybody that hasn't been online today, could you please get in touch with them, ask them to contact us or ask them if they're happy for, the, for you to pass on their contact details to us, that we can set up a network. And uh, Ian, your, your, your suggestions for um, you know, an online presence, I think is excellent. And I think going forward, it's definitely the way, the way to go. Um, um, the one the one thing I did enjoy was Nigel your your summation of Paul being Ireland's version of of uh, Elizabeth Hall. I think I think it's very good. <laughs> um, Deepish, do you want to say anything before we finish up? Yeah. So um, uh, thank you all. Uh, it's it has been a wonderful event, um, much more than what we had uh, previously imagined. And thank you again for all your support and for support for the alumni. Um, so what we will do is uh, we'll put together some structure. Uh, so it won't be any formal or anything. So what we would like to do is uh, come up with more, uh, as uh, Ian says, some sort of online presence. So we probably may create a website or something. So it will be mostly an uh, email group, the Facebook group, uh, the, uh, the websites, and we'll just be connected to our networks. So that's pretty much it. Uh, we'll work on that myself, uh, Alison, Patrick. I uh, will request for help from Paul and everybody, uh, and we'll get back to you uh, um, in the in due course of time. Uh, and also, as Alison said, if you have contacts with other Mount Everest summiters, please do let us know. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, so the goal here is to let's uh, create a, a very good network of mountains, uh, Mount Everest summiters in Ireland uh, as an alumni. And then once we have a very uh, well-defined or successful approach, and then we can basically uh, uh, expand our uh, wings toward the rest of the Europe and create a network uh, of the European uh, alumni as such, and maybe the rest of the world as well. Again, having said that, uh, I would like to thank everybody again uh, for all the speakers, uh, our chief guest, um, our, our distinguished guest, and all the Mount Everest summiters for your support and your time today. And have a wonderful uh, the rest of the uh, weekend. And it's very uh, excellent outside. Probably we'll go for a walk after this. Uh, thank you again. Bye bye.